John chapter 4, and of course I mentioned David Taylor uh, there a second ago. Let's see. Who else? Yeah, I uh, John chapter 4. We, we were dealing with the woman at the well. And uh, we talked about several issues. Of course, number one, the race issue. Uh, her being a woman of Samaria, a Samaritan woman. And she's the one that brought it up. Why is it that uh, here I am? Is my microphone still not on? Now let's try this again. You know what? Let's put fresh batteries in it. How's that? Uh, maybe next time Rose goes out to shopping to Walmart or something like that, she can buy something that whoever's up in the sound booth can throw at me to get my attention to let me know the microphone ain't working. It would probably take something a little bit harder than that. So, all right, now we're on. Now we're good. Um, let me ask you, let's read this, and I'm going to ask you a question here in a minute. All right, John chapter 4, verse 20. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. Now I'm going to ask you the question here in a, in a minute. What is worship? What is it? Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Now let me stop here and give you the, the biblical background of this. This goes all the way back to after Solomon died. Because of David's sin with Bathsheba, God had said, the sword shall never depart from thy house. And certainly in David's day after that, I mean, he had family problems all the time after that. Uh, God made a promise concerning Solomon. He wasn't going to break that promise. And Solomon was, without a doubt, the greatest king aside from Jesus that the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, ever, have ever known. Um, and God used him well. The, the nation of Israel, there was no more powerful nation in the world at that time. There was, there was no more wealthier nation in the world at that time. But anyway, after Solomon died, and his son Rehoboam was petitioned by the elder men to lower the taxes because Solomon had taxed everybody plum silly building the temple building his palace he built built all these pagan temples for these wives that he had he had to live this lavish lifestyle and he's taxing everybody and his men come to him or they come to his son, Rehoboam, and say, lower the taxes. Please, lower the taxes. These people will love you. They'll follow you. But Rehoboam, a young man, had young friends that were also counseling him. And his young friends were enjoying the fact that they had a rich king buddy. And they're like, I wouldn't lower taxes. If I, if I were you, I'd raise them. So he had a chance to listen to those wise, aged men and lower the taxes. How many, how many revolutions have been started in this world as a result of kings and monarchs and princes and senators taking too much money from those who earned it who re and stole it from the people who actually worked and earned it and those people wouldn't earn it themselves. But anyway, that's what happened. There was a revolt. The nation was divided in half. Jeroboam, who was an enemy, who used to be a servant of Solomon, Jeroboam led a revolt, took the ten northern tribes, separated them away from the two lower tribes of Judah and Benjamin, and you have a divided kingdom. And you'll see that all if you if you read first 
and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, you'll see all these kings, the kings of a king of Judah or a king of Israel. Israel is the ten northern tribes. And you'll see that all throughout there. Okay? And um, what happened right after that was Jeroboam, not being a godly man, built a pagan temple in Samaria put two golden calves in it. One of them's not enough. You've got to have two of them in there. But anyway, there is a division now amongst the children of Israel and they don't like each other. In fact, they hate each other. And there's all this competition about who does God favor, who does God like. It kind of sounds like us nowadays. Who does God like and who's, who's got, you know, God's not going to let those people in heaven. They, they've got the wrong whatever this and that and the other. And that's what's going on here. The Samaritans are saying, we worship in this mountain. We are told by our, our Jewish brethren in Jerusalem that we cannot worship at this mountain of Samaria. We must only worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus is going to straighten that out. Where is it that you are, where is it that you can worship? And I'm going to ask you that in a little bit. But listen, look at what Jesus said. Jesus said under verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. And he's talking about earthly Jerusalem. Ye worship, ye know not what. You have, he said, you don't even have an idea of the God you're worshiping. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. Now Jesus is not being racially mean to this woman or that's not a racial slur. What is he talking about here? I'm going to ask you, what do you think? When Jesus said salvation is of the Jews, according to what we know now, who are the Jews? Who is the Israel of God? It's all saints. Both Gentile and Jew. Okay? That's according to the Bible. He, Paul said it all the time. To the Jew first, then to the Greek. Or what he meant by that was the Gentile, the pagan. Okay? The heathens. So, when he said salvation is of the Jews... He means those who are children unto Abraham by faith. Okay? And that hasn't really been taught yet. Um, Christ has to suffer and die on the cross, rise again. He's going to give those revelations to the apostles. Then they're going to teach it. But this woman is hearing something now she's never heard in her life before. And it's changing her. He said, the hour cometh and now is when the true, verse 23, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Somebody say amen. What difference does a mountain make then? Is my point. Okay? Now, what is, in your opinion, and I'm not going to pick on you if you're wrong or whatever, don't worry about it. What is worship? And the Bible actually will define it for you. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to define worship. What is worship? In in, in your mind and heart, what, how you see it happening, what is worship? Giving, giving honor to God. Okay. That's good. Anybody else? Praising Him. Okay. Uh, when we sing these songs. Okay. Now, can lost people... Is it possible that lost people 
can worship and reverence Jesus Christ? Okay? That's a big question, isn't it? Let me tell you the story of a, of a man that we, that, we, that we met in uh, Megori, Kenya. Um, we were holding a, a series of meetings, I mean, I mean way out of town. But they were wonderful, wonderful people. I mean, God bless that. I loved it. But I had, that was one of the places where I had a lot of spiritual trouble there. Every time I'd preach, Michael, get me back to the motel. And I would just, I would just lay down. I would just lay down and do nothing. But anyway, they, there was a, a young man that they had asked. I, I'm, I'm sure they hired him. That's how they do it over there. They hired him to lead the worship. Okay? To lead the worship. And so what that meant was he's the man. He's going to be getting the music going. Um, and I, I don't remember. I don't recall if there was... Guys playing instruments or somebody playing a keyboard or they were just playing it pre-recorded. I don't remember. But the first first service we had, this guy, he started putting on the biggest show I've ever seen. I mean, he was dancing, cartwheels, you name it. He was just, he was, he was showing off was what he was doing. And... We got to talking about it after the, after that day, and I Mike Hutzel asked me. He said, "Did you notice that?" And I said, "Yeah." I said, "That guy was getting on my nerves," and I said, "You know, I've got plenty of other problems going on up here, but that guy there, I got no use for him." I, and it, I was. I, I mean, I just had a I had a bad spirit that week. Mike said, "I'm going to address it tomorrow during. I'm going to preach on that issue tomorrow," and he preached this portion of scripture God is the spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth I don't know who preached what message but I know that during that week God broke that man and we had an invitation and I mean he is down on his face before God and he's just shaking like this crying weeping and God just dealing with him, dealing with his sin or whatever. And without us going to him and saying, you know, you could cut this stuff out. We had, been, we had just spent a week in Kilimambogo where, I mean, these are Africans. They don't stand still when they worship. Okay. And it was, it was great to watch them. It was enjoyable. And you could tell that just because their mannerisms and their traditions and maybe even in their DNA, there's something that says when the, mu when the music goes, you move. Okay? But we, we had spent all week with Pastor Calonzo out in Kilimambogo and I, I, my joke is that all, us three preachers look like secret service agents standing there, you know. And all these people were singing and, you know, we're just, it, it's just not us. Uh, we decided to sing a trio song, uh, Mike Hutzel, Brent Hutzel, and myself, and sang an acapella trio song. And, you know, I think maybe they kind of liked it a little bit. But I don't think they were too impressed. And I thought it was a good song. I thought we did well. Okay. But anyway, so we had come from that where we saw, had really seen God move to this guy who thought he was going to move God. And that was the difference. Once God broke this man instantaneously, there is a change in how he's leading and conducting those services. You could tell God was working in him. You could tell he'd listen. I don't remember everything Mike said in that mess. In fact, I don't remember a thing he said. But I know that God got to that man and you saw him change. 
Now they still dance a little. They clap their hands. They move. They'll do like you know one of these, you know, like Gladys Knight and the Pips. Okay, I mean that's that's the only way I can describe it for you. But you could tell now that this man is not. He is not worshiping God in his flesh. He's leaving his flesh out of it. He's got something now to praise God for. A broken and contrite heart is what God is looking for. And God broke that man that week. I'll never forget that as long as I live. Okay, now, there would be, there would be white churches in this area who would accuse us of being dead, dry, there's nothing there at that church. I mean, if you've been in their worship service, I mean, there's nothing to it. You know, the preacher forgets the verses half the time. You know, he, they don't play it in the right key. You know, they would, they would accuse us of being a dead church simply because we don't boogie woogie. Now, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily just bash a church because of what style of music they're using. Okay? There are other things that will go along with it that will give me cause to say, I think that, I think there's, I think that's a corrupt tree. There's, I think there's a corrupt tree in that church. I think there is. Uh, anybody else got anything to say about worship? What you think it is? What is worship? Rose. Okay. Yes, you can do that. Uh, doing that in what we would call public worship or corporate worship, where you have everybody doing it together, is it possible to worship God privately and alone? Yes. Okay, now, here's what, and keep, keep in mind, let's read this again. Keep in mind now what Jesus said to this woman. N number one, where you worship does not matter to God. Never, 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 never. And don't let anybody tell you that. Don't let, what, what, what are we, Muslims? We got to face Mecca every five times a day and pray. Okay? This week they would have had a hard time finding the sun this week to face east. Okay? But Jesus said, the hour cometh and now is, verse 23, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father. In spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God, now, this is God's nature. God, and God said in Exodus 20 in the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, because I'm a jealous God. Now, God is revealing to mankind His nature. And He is a loving, wonderful, merciful God. But He's jealous. And he says, you cannot worship me and another God. I will not have it. I won't have it. Okay? His mercy stops right there. Because he's a jealous God. He says, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what is the definition of worship? If you do the etymology, which is what I like to do, the word comes from the phrase worth-ship. In other words, you are saying that what you are worshiping is worthy of your worship. Okay? We worship God because we believe that he is worthy of receiving that worship. D did not God just save us from going to hell for eternity? Does that not right then, if he doesn't do anything else for us, does that not now qualify him to be worshipped the rest of our lives and the rest of eternity? Yes! So it, that's where the, the, the source of the word worship, worth-ship. Okay? He is worthy to be praised. So Deuteronomy eleven sixteen. 16. Here's, here's the meaning. Take heed. You can write these down. Turn to them. 
Look up at the screen. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And you can, you can find this probably, I didn't, I didn't do a number on it, but probably in the scores of times in the Bible where God will, will identify the word worship with the word serve. Serve. So what is worship? Serving God. Okay. Now, serving God, yes, does involve us coming in. You know, when, the, when we open the doors to come in to sing His praise, to magnify Him, to be Christians, to be Christian in our character, our nature, our heart, to follow Him, to do what He tells us to do, to serve Him in the house of God. Um, and what did, what did Jesus say? serves Jesus. Well, Jesus said when he divides the sheep from the goats, it's about in as much as you've done it to the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. So is helping someone who is destitute out, is that part of serving God and worshiping him? I would say yes, because it is a commandment that Christ has given to us in fact, the, the two of them that we're under are love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and then love our neighbor as ourself. If we were the ones who were destitute, if we were the ones who had COVID, if we were the ones who, who needed some help, what, in whatever way, we would want someone to help, we would need somebody to help us. Okay? And, that, and that's just part of it. So he defines it here. And he said, take heed unto yourselves that your heart be not deceived and turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. So he says in Deuteronomy 17, 3 this way, and hath gone and served other gods and worshiped them. So that's twice now he's put it together. And I, again, I don't know how many times it is in the Bible, but it's multiple, multiple times where the Bible says they went and worshiped other gods and served them. In fact, I may, I may have a list here yeah first kings 22 53 for he served Baal and worshiped him so in worshiping Baal he did what Baal told him to do and provoked anger the Lord God of Israel according to all that his father had done First, uh, second Kings 21, 21, he walked in all the way that his father walked in and served the idols that his father served and worshiped them. Whatever the idols demanded, that's what he did. And that was how he worshiped them. Um, so let me, let me go back in my notes here. So to worship God is to serve him. It, it is to do what he tells you to do. It is to obey him. It is to have him in your heart. It is to have him in your mind. It is that he is not, and again, your flesh does not impress God. Your singing prowess. Matthew's complaining that since COVID, he lost his voice. And I've had more than one person write our ministry and say, boy, your son's got a tremendous voice. They don't say that to me. They say it about him, and I agree with them. But whether he can sing as good as Pavarotti can, or Glenn Campbell, or anybody else, doesn't amount to a hill of beans if his heart is not right with God. You've, ex you've exchanged one for the other. Because I can sing better and I can do this with my voice or I can play an instrument or I can all these things. I can beat on the drums good and I can control the lights and the fog machine because I have this talent. I can, I can worship people better than, than other people can. That's baloney. That's a lie. And I, I, have, I have seen that all my life where 
the gospel music industry, whether it's southern gospel, which is the kind of gospel I like, whether it's contemporary, whether it's whatever kind of gospel type music it is, the industry itself is corrupt and the people up on the stage lead horrific lifestyles. I'll just tell you, I would just tell you about Southern Gospel music, what I know about that. Because I have a pastor friend whose son was a tenor singer for a Southern Gospel quartet. Now these tenor singers, if you're a good one, you can just about name your price in the Southern Gospel music industry because groups love to get these tenor singers that can belt out them high notes and end the song out with that note and hold it out. And these guys are paid well. One, one particular tenor singer, I won't mention his name because I like him, he's a good guy. Uh, he was with a well-known group. A guy paid him, he said, I'm going to give you, I'm going to start a ministry in your name and I'm going to get you started with a million dollars. And gave this, gave this tenor singer a million dollars to start his own quartet and go around singing gospel music all over the country. Million bucks, just like that. Just wrote him a check and said, here you go, take off. Now, this, this young man, this is a pastor's son. We, he, he just happened to be singing at the same place that some preachers were preaching. And I was at that meeting. It was Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And we had lunch together. And his, his daddy was saying, Brother Mike, listen to this. And he said, son, tell him what you know. And he didn't really want to say it, but he said, he said, I can name for you right now three tenor singers that are queer. Big name. One of them had to come out, and it was Kirk Talley. He was being uh, blackmailed and had to come out and confessed that, yes, he tried to cover it up with a marriage. But as, as far as singers and songwriters, he was, he was number one. Okay? There wasn't a place that wouldn't have him sing until they found out what he'd been doing. And that all dried up. But he said, I can name for you three of them right now. Funny thing is, I have always suspected he was one. This young man that I was talking to. Okay, And he said, do you know so-and-so? And I said, yeah. He said, he is known in the industry as one of the biggest adulterers that there is. He's, he sings solo now. He goes by himself. Uh, one group in particular, it was a dad, and he started it with his, with his two sons. Magnificent sound. They had a wonderful family. Family sounds... When families get together and sing, they sound good because their voices are similar. They're real tight harmony. Well, the father found out that one of the sons was having an affair in multiple places where they went. And that father, after dealing with his son, drove the bus home, took the website down, put a for sale sign on the bus. And he said, I did not get in this to bring shame to Jesus Christ. God bless him for it. Okay. But I'm telling you, it's corrupt. There's a lot of corruption in that business. Yes. Huh? I suspect that he is a sodomite. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't know any of the names of of any others. Okay. But clearly corruption in there. And it's sort of in the minds of church people that because these people are talented and can play the piano like nobody else can and can sing like nobody else can, that they are spiritual people. That's not true. One does not have a thing to do with the other. In the contemporary music, and when I say contemporary, I'm, I'm covering everything. I don't even know the names of groups anymore. I just I quit even looking into it years ago. But a couple years ago, there was one of these big name 
contemporary Christian groups, the lead singer, after they shut the group down, admitted, I don't even believe in God, never did. But the thing was, they were not getting gigs in secular places like they wanted, so their agent started getting them in churches. And they started making pretty good money after that. And they would have, they would have altar calls. And, these, and, they, and, and the guy said, they would always beg me to come down and pray over their kids over them. And I'd always try to get out of it somehow, some way, because I didn't, I didn't believe a word of that Bible. And kids all over the altar. That's not God. That is, that is a replacement for the, for the move of the Holy Spirit. Preachers and musicians can excite the emotions of people in the pews and bring them down to the altar and make a fair showing. But it's not real. It's not true. It's not Bible Christianity. It is a phony replacement of it. Anyway, now, in your Bible, turn to Acts chapter 5. Here you have evidence, biblical evidence, of what I'm talking about. A man in the church who actually was serving Satan himself. Acts chapter 5 verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession... And kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it. And brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles feet. But Peter said and notice what he said. Ananias why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Who had control of Ananias' heart? The Holy Ghost or Satan? Satan did. Who did Ananias serve? Satan. It's as, plain, it's as plain as black and white. He served Satan. Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost. In other words, Ananias did what the devil told him to do. Did you know that you can tell the devil no? Imagine that. Uh, how about, no, Satan? You can tell him, no. He does not own you. He does not control you. He can tempt you. He can vex you. He can aggravate you to death. He can weigh you down. He can just about destroy you. He can do everything that God allowed Satan to, to do to Job. He can do all of those things and probably more. But he cannot force your will. Ananias clearly did not worship God nor serve God. It is obvious that he served Satan because he did what Satan told him to do. Now, people go to church and they worship Mary. What does that mean to worship Mary? Mary. Well, number one, they sing praises to her. Ave Maria. I mean, I know it. They sing praises to her. They pray to her specifically. That's what Ave Maria, gratia plena. Um, what's the rest of it in Latin? Um... Holy Mary, Mater Dei, Ora Pro Nobis, uh, Peccatoribus, Nunc et in Ora, something. Anyway, pray for us, Mary, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Okay? But it's not just praying or bowing to her. Uh, there's been several apparitions, appearances, allegedly, of the Virgin Mary around the world. The one at Fatima is a very famous one where three children said that they were seeing the Virgin Mary appearing 
shining bright as the sun, and they were staring right at it. And here's what Mary told everybody to do. My daughter, look at my heart surrounded with thorns with which ungrateful men pierce it at every moment by their blasphemies and ingratitude. You, at least, try to console me and say that I promise to assist at the hour of death. That's the Hail Mary prayer. With all the graces necessary for salvation. Did you see what Mary just said? Mary just said that she supplies all the graces necessary for salvation. And she said, all those who on the first Saturday of five consecutive months go to confession and receive Holy Communion and recite five decades or five, uh, it would be ten groups of the rosary and keep me company for a quarter of an hour while meditating on the mysteries of the rosy, rosary with the intention of making reparation to me. In other words, and, and I have a book that has all kinds of sayings like this where Mary has said to people, do this, do this, do this, do this. Pray the rosary. Pray it three times a day every day. Do it, tw do it eight times on Saturday. Do it like this. And people do this. So they not only bow and give her reverence, they do what she tells them to do. And what is odd to me is how a Roman Catholic would have a problem in a world if Mary came and told them to do some stupid nonsense like this. And you can't get people who claim to be Christians. They don't do anything. I'm not anybody's judge. Don't want to be. But clearly, and I'm not, I'm not, preaching a works gospel I'm telling you that if God is in your heart you won't be able to help but worship him and he will work in you he will be doing the work in you the fruit will be on the tree by no effort of your own but it will be there and that is God manifesting in your life that yes they worship me and they serve me um, Daniel chapter th turn, turn to Daniel chapter 3 you can tell the devil no Daniel chapter 3 verse 12 you know the story, Nebuchadnezzar set up this image, told everybody when you hear the music, bow, fall, fall down. They decided not to. So the report was brought to King Nebuchadnezzar, there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? See, the commandment was, it's not that you just look at and say, Oh, how pretty. Nebuchadnezzar made the requirement that they must fall and bow to that image thereby worshiping that image. And these three men said, no. We don't serve gods made with hands. And we never will. Verse 16, Shagrat, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, whom we what? Did, were they worshiping God on that day? Yes. You see it now? They were giving their worship and their praise to God by not serving that idol and not serving King Nebuchadnezzar. The God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. 
But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship. So he puts them together almost every time in the Bible. You get to software and look at, and look, and look at worship, type in worship, put in another thing, type in serve or whatever, and you'll see, I don't know how many times. John, are you doing that? How many times you got so far? 59? 29? 59? That's, that's enough for me. I need two or three witnesses, but 59 will work. Okay? But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. We won't do it. So worship... Um, Matthew 4.10, Then said Jesus unto them, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou, what? Serve. Serve. Romans 1.22, Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Worshiped and served. There it is again. Who is blessed forever. Amen. So, I don't have a I don't have a problem with us when we sing, sing some get up go songs. I like them. I don't have a problem with us singing some of them that are a little bit slower than maybe some people like. I like those too. I like hymns. I like all kinds of our music, hymns and, and spiritual songs that we have in our hymn book. I, I like them. That's, that, to me, that's the Lord's song, and I love singing the Lord's song. And I'll do it whether anybody's listening or not. I'll do it whether anybody hears me or not. And I've had some wonderful times sitting at a piano playing when I knew nobody was around listening and just weeping before the Lord or singing. No piano, no guitar. Not, I don't play guitar, but no piano, nothing. Just singing to the Lord and just bawling my eyes out, just weeping. I can do it alone or I can do it here with y'all. Or if this place burnt down, we'd just do it out in the parking lot. Not to be seen of men. Not to put on a show. And I've always tried to be very careful of that. The, the very first time we streamed, before we ever did it. I don't know who remembers this, but we had a talk. And this, this goes back to, I think, about 20... 11, I think is when we started live streaming. We had a talk. Should, should we go live or should we just keep recording it, putting it on? In fact, we found out families wanted us to be live. And that's why we have what we have now. But I said to this church, I am not going to start putting on a show for everybody just because we have cameras I won't do it. And certainly we don't. I am not the most gifted musician in the world. I like to play the piano. I like to sing. But I, I don't practice the way some other people do, which is why I make the mistakes I make. And sometimes my mind is chasing dogs everywhere while I'm supposed to be looking at what verse comes next. And that's why I do that. And I will make mistakes. But I believe that... I would say, hopefully for the most part, 
when we come together on Sunday morning, I would hopefully believe that most everybody here is worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. Okay? You do that. Keep the flesh out of it. And if there's anything that is hindering you from worshiping God, get it out of the way. Get, God, get this out of my heart. Take this nasty, un, un, unclean, filthy thing away from me so that I can worship you the way you deserve to be worshiped. God, I don't want to bring anything unclean into God's house and act like I'm worshiping you. Amen.